here's the context. You, you see, you have four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you read all of them together, and it gives you the full narrative of what went on in Jesus' life. So if you look at Luke's gospel, chapter 22, verses 23 and 24, at the serving of the Last Supper, which is what this is, you see these words, and they began to question one another which one of them it could be who was going to do this. That's the betrayal. And then a dispute also arose among them as to which one of them was regarded as the greatest. You got it? This was the third time the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, started arguing among themselves regarding which one of them was the greatest. Now we see in verses 1 through 3 that Jesus knew he was going to die the next day. This is the Passover celebration on Thursday. He's going to die on Friday. And he teaches them that he would soon depart and go to the Father. And he was so excited to have these disciples whom he had loved to the end. And, and during the supper, the devil had already entered into Judas Iscariot. Judas had already made a deal with the devil and sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And Jesus, knowing then that as they argued among themselves again, which one was the greatest? He then sat down, took off his outer garment, put a towel around him with a basin of water, and he went from person to person to person to person washing their feet. It's a powerful moment in the life of Jesus. And then he starts to wash Peter's feet, and the impulsive Peter as he most often did, objects and says, no, you can't wash my feet. You see, in that day, people would walk long distances on dirty, dusty roads with sandals, and they would come to a house, and usually a hired slave was the one who would wash their feet before dinner. But now dinner had already begun. And when you ate in Jesus' day, you would rest on your left elbow with your head right next to the person's chest who was to your left, and then your feet would be next to their stomachs or so. So you can just imagine the foot washing had not yet happened. So Peter, with all his toenail fungus, had his foot in somebody's chest. And, and then there was John, with all of his calluses, had his foot in somebody's chest. And, and there was Thomas, with, with all of his smelly, odor-eater needing feet, right next to somebody's chest. And, and in that scenario, with their feet yet to be washed, was when Jesus said, guys, sit up. And he went from person to person and started washing their feet. And Peter just said, no, you can't wash my feet. You know, you know you're the master. I'm the servant. You can't do that. And Jesus said, if, if, Peter, if you don't let me wash you, you have no part of me. And what Jesus was referring to there was baptism, the full washing of your whole body. He was basically saying, Pete, you need to be all in. I want every part of you. And that's what this is partially about. And then Peter, of course, responds and says, well, then wash every part of me over and over again. And then Jesus says, you need to understand there are going to be times, even when you're all in, and this is an important teaching, folks, listen to this. Even when you're all in and you love me with all your heart, there are going to be times you get dirt on your feet. You're still going to make decisions that hurt my heart. You're going to attract the sin of this world still upon you, and you're going to still need to be washed clean. And that's why 1 John 1, 9 says to Christians, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just and forgives you of all unrighteousness. Because you're going to continue to have to go back to Jesus' cleansing love to wash off that stuff that we just get even when we follow Jesus with every ounce of our being. And then Jesus says something so powerful after this encounter with Peter. He says, do you understand what I've done to you? And you call me teacher and Lord, and, and you're right to do so, for I am your teacher and Lord. That means he not only teaches us great stuff, he is Lord over our lives. Every area of our lives belongs to Jesus. And then he says, I've given you an example. I've given you an example as your teacher and your Lord. And then he says, truly, truly, I say to you, a servant's not greater than the teacher, right? Right? I mean, I mean, if the teacher does it, the servant should too, right? And the messenger is not greater than the one who sent the messenger. If the messenger has the message from the one who sent the messenger, it's the messenger giving the words of the one who has more power. And so he should use 
the example of the one who has power for how he should live his life. And then Jesus says something extraordinary that I referred to at the beginning of the message. Do you really want to be blessed? Do you really want the favor of God upon your life? Well, if you do, read verse 17 over and over again. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. There's one thing in knowing something. There's a whole other thing in doing something. So Jesus said, if you've got this idea that I've called you as an example, as my servants, to wash people's feet, to give your life away, not to seek celebrity, but to seek servanthood, not to seek superstardom, but to seek servanthood. If you've got that idea, I'm going to bless you when you do it. Not, not, not literally washing people's feet, though there are some churches that do that. It is a figurative example of giving your life away, of serving other people. It is a continued theme expressed throughout the Scripture. Two major truths from these verses. You were created to serve. Secondly, you're blessed when you do serve. Again, those are the two ideas. You were created to serve. Secondly, you're blessed when you do serve. And these truths, again, are all throughout the Bible. Let me give you a few examples. Genesis 12, 3. When the sin problem shattered the world, God called a man named Abraham, and he began the covenant promise with him for the redemption of the world. And he says to him, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Here's the simple phraseology for Abraham's covenant with God. God said, I'm going to bless you so that you will be a blessing. Let me say it again. I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. And again, another place where this theme is seen, Isaiah 58, 10. If you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desires of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as noonday. I gave Marilyn a bracelet one time for our anniversary with that verse on it because she believes in it so much. You know what it's saying? If you're depressed, discouraged, in despair, go serve somebody, the poor, the naked, the oppressed, the hungry, the needy. And if you'll do that, your depression will lift. It's a promise of God's word. When we get depressed, most of us get driven deeper into depression because of whatever. Yet the Bible says, go give your life away. And if you wash other people's feet, if you do that, you'll be blessed. Your own depression will lift. Galatians 5.13, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You're free. You're no longer under the bondage of the law determining whether you're going to go to heaven or hell. It's been given to you as a free gift by grace through Jesus if you believe in him. Just don't use that freedom to intentionally sin to get God's grace again. But use that freedom to go serve somebody else in love. That's why you were set free. Galatians 6, 9. And let us not grow weary of well-doing for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Reap what? Reap what? The blessing. the blessing from God. If you continue to do good, serve other people, it might not happen immediately. You might have to wait for it a while. God's purposes sometimes demand waiting, right? But in the waiting, you'll ultimately discover in due time God's blessing. And Philippians 2, 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And then Paul goes on to describe Jesus in heaven, an equal relationship with the Father. The Father says, leave heaven, enter the squalor of that world, put on human flesh, live the perfect life they can't live, go to the cross where you take all the penalty of their sin upon yourself, their death that they should have experienced poured out upon you, and then you will go into the grave be raised from the dead and ascended back to me. But while you're on earth, you will be a total servant in obedience to me. And Jesus purposefully chose to put on human flesh, not thinking equality with God was something to be grasped, and he humbled himself to the point of being a servant. Philippians 2, 6 through 11. And that's the mindset we're supposed to have. The mindset of followers of Jesus is we are on this earth 
to wash people's feet. We are on this earth to serve. We are on this earth to be blessed when we do serve. That is God's call upon our lives. Here's the application. Our job description on this side of eternity is to find a need and fill it. Say it after me. Our job description is to find a need and fill it. It is that simple. This past week, on Monday and Tuesday night, we had the Women Under Construction event uh, at the South Park campus where Marilyn and I interviewed Gentry and Hadley Eddings. It was just incredible. Almost 2,000 women came out to hear their powerful, powerful testimony. At the end, I was talking with a woman who came up to me and said, you know, I, I really want to live for Jesus, but I just don't know his grand destiny for my life. I just don't know his big plan for my life. And I said, well, I'm not sure I can help you much there. But let me tell you what I can do. Let me tell you God's will for your life tomorrow. She said, what's that? I said, wherever you work, wherever you may be, there's going to be somebody who needs your touch, who needs an encouraging word from you, who needs some hope that only you can give them. So just begin your day by saying, God, I am here to wash the feet of somebody that you're going to bring into my life for your glory. And she said, that's all? I said, that's it. It's that easy. And then if you do that day in, day out, I believe God will then reveal the larger destiny. But you won't find it until you're faithful every single day in that 24-hour period that God just gives you ahead. And when you're faithful during that day, giving yourself, washing the feet of people in your sphere of influence, God then says, well done. And he starts to bless us like you can't ever begin to imagine. We're supposed to find a hurt and heal it and find a need and fill it. We're to find a hurt and heal it and find a need and fill it. So every day, your spiritual antenna should be up saying, God, give me an insight into somebody around me who's hurting. Maybe by a look on their face or drooped shoulders or a bit of a scowl or whatever it may be, I want to be a blessing for you. I want to be somebody who washes the feet of people in my family, my coworkers, even my boss. I want to be your servant wherever you may place me. Mother Teresa understood this, the great saint of Calcutta. Did you know that when she first took her vows as a nun, she had a commitment to be cloistered in the monastery, and she could not leave the walls of the monastery. She kept looking out the window day in, day out, and seeing the poor, the hungry, the needy, the oppressed, the disenfranchised, the naked, and her heart was moved. And she felt this call of God that's evidenced, by the way, in a movie that's come out fairly recently called The Letters. And, and as you See, in the movie, she appealed to her higher-ups to have her vows broken so that she could leave the convent and go walk among the hurting in her sphere of influence. And there was a lot of rigmarole that went on in the hierarchy. But finally, after some period of time, they permitted her to go. So she left the convent, and she went and lived among the broken people there in India. Now, what's so interesting is as she just started relating to the folks, the first thing she decided to do was to teach the children how to read. And she spent hours every day just teaching them in their illiteracy how to read. Pretty soon, there arose a mob led by one particular man in that village, in that city, who did not want her there. And he had a power encounter with a mob with Mother Teresa wanting her to leave. And let me show you a clip from the movie on what that looked like. Watch this. Well, she continues to stay in the village and minister to the people in whatever way she can, washing their feet, loving them. She has medical training, so she often gives medical care. And then that husband and wife that were so antagonistic toward her, she got pregnant and was about to deliver her child, but the child was breech. 
And for those of you who know anything about child deliveries, breach is a huge problem if you don't have the right medical care. Uh, so it looks like the mom and the child are both going to die, and somebody remembers Mother Teresa. And they go to her and bring her to the house of the two most ardent and fervent antagonists against her. Now, watch what happens as she helps turn the breech baby, the baby's delivered, and then especially note what happens at the end of this next clip. Notice she didn't want her feet kissed because there's only one who deserves to have his feet kissed. His name is Jesus. She knows she's immortal. But that man and his wife, and I bet that whole village, his life began to change because Mother Teresa committed herself to wash the feet of the villagers. She lived by what St. Francis of Assisi taught. He said, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, and if necessary, say something. Now, you do need to say something. Because God has given us a mouth and faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. So we need to say something. But I just wonder if in America today we would have a profound change of attitude toward those of us who are biblical Christians. If we would choose to wash people's feet first before we ever said a word. What do you think? Jesus said, I've given you this as an example. And if you do it, I'll bless you. Oh, by the way, how did God bless Mother Teresa? Well, she appeared before the United States Congress and went to Harvard University, not exactly a bastion of conservatism, right? And she lectured the Harvard Dons for over an hour on the sacredness of human life in the womb. And they gave her a standing ovation. You know why? Why? Because she washed people's feet. She served the poorest of the poor. She earned the right to be heard. So we're moving toward Easter. I would invite all of you to go out and wash the feet of your friends and family members and use it as a chance to invite them to come. You're getting in your email boxes evangelism styles that you can operate in. I'm giving you 10 different proofs of the resurrection. They'll be sent out two per week for the next several weeks. But just reach out to your friends and first make a commitment to wash their feet and then invite them. I love the story of a young man, this is a true story, uh, was having to go door to door to sell different items in order to make uh, enough money to go to medical school, which was his dream. And he went to this one door and he rang it. He was so hungry, just famished. And this really cute young girl opened the door and he tried to sell her something. And she said, we really don't need that, but you just look famished. Can I get you something to eat? And he went, no, no, I don't want to make you get me something to eat. She said, well, let me at least give you a big tall cold glass of milk and he said well well okay and so she went and got him that milk and he said it was like drinking the best drink he'd ever drank in his life and of course he went on to make the sales and went on to medical school well one day while he was at his hospital a young girl was admitted a very attractive girl and she had a serious ailment and it looked like she was going to die he had the specialty in her particular area so he came and looked at her finally figured out what was wrong And then said, you look really familiar. And he went to her records and saw her hometown. He went, that's the hometown where I went door to door. And he recognized this girl as the one who gave him a tall, cold glass of milk at a time he really needed one. Well, she went home with this huge medical bill, received it in the mail, only to have stamped on it, paid in full. And underneath, Dr. Kelly, the doctor wrote, paid in full, by a tall glass of cold milk. You just can't outgive God. You just can't. And when you choose to wash the feet of people in your life, you never really know where it might go from there. This happened just a couple of years ago. There was a coffee shop, and you know how the drive throughs now? And so this guy ordered his coffee and then he said here's an extra twenty dollars that's for the person behind me and when they pulled to the window say i paid in full he drove off and the next car pulled up and the person said hey your bill's been taken care of what do you want and so he said well i'll take this but then i'm paying for the person behind me as well and then he pulled off same thing happened 80 different cars 
went through the drive through with the person in front of them paying the bill. I don't want to know what God thought of the 81st person, but anyway, I just, <laughs> I've wondered, though, maybe that person couldn't pay. And, and it really was able to stop with that person because that person really didn't have enough. Who, who knows? But what a beautiful story, isn't it? As you give, it motivates other people to give as you wash people's feet. It, it motivates them to want to wash other people's feet because you were created to serve and you're blessed. You're blessed when you wash people's feet. You to find hurts and heal them, find needs and heal them. That's what God has for all of us in our lives. So today, would you dare to think in terms of those people in your lives that you could go wash their feet? You know, there's this verse in Ephesians 5 that says, Wives, be submissive to your husbands. For some of you men, that's the only verse you've ever memorized in the Bible. <laughs> and you just think, you just need to be here to serve me. But what you fail to realize is the next verse says, And husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, who's willing to die to give the church life. So let me tell you the best interpretation of those two verses I can give you. Husbands, wash your wife's feet. Your job is to serve her, not use her, not condemn her, not abuse her. Your job is to serve her like Christ serves the church. Wives, your job is to serve your husbands, not demand from him, not nag him. Your job is to serve him. And let me tell you something. If we had in this church every man committed to wash the feet of his wife and every wife committed to wash the feet of her husband, both of them committed to serving each other, let me tell you something. The divorce rate becomes nil. It doesn't exist. Because the reason divorce happens is because one or both of the partners says, I'm no longer going to serve you. I'm not here to meet your needs. I'm out of here. I'm going to find somebody else. So who in your sphere of influence can you wash the other person's feet? You'll be blessed when you do. Mother Teresa said that she was a pencil in the hand of God. I love that. She was a pencil in the hand of God. Who might you reach out to and wash their feet? There's a, a story of a, a line of people trying to get into the circus, and this one family with eight children was trying to get in, and they asked the ticket master how much it would be, and the ticket master gave a price, and they all just looked at each other and realized they didn't have enough for all those children. And the man behind watching all of this happened dropped $40 on the sawdust. He reached down and says, oh, excuse me, sir, I'm convinced that you dropped this $40. Here it is. Please use this to buy the tickets for your kids. Well, it didn't take the dad long to realize what the man had done, but he turned to him with tears in his eyes and said, little did you know, little did you know, that this was my Christmas gift to my eight children, and it was all the money I had, and I didn't have any more. Thank you so much for giving me this marvelous gift. Sometimes it's just the joy of knowing you've done the right thing. That's the blessing, right? God wants to bless you, but he wants you to do this because it's the right thing to do, and it's the right way to live. So find a need and fill it. And then some of you are thinking, but what happens if no one sees my foot washing? And I'm going to tell you this. It doesn't matter. But there is one who does see. And let me ask you something. To what audience are you playing? Are you playing to people's approval around you so that you'll get exalted? Or might you be playing to an audience of one only to hear the applause of God himself? You know, in Acts, the seventh chapter, Stephen gave his life for his faith in Jesus. He was stoned to death. And right at the end of chapter 7 in Acts, 
Look at what happened. It says, and Jesus was standing at the right hand of the Father. I've never noticed this before till this week. Jesus was standing at the right hand of the Father as Stephen saw this vision of God. And what's the significant thing? He was standing. He was giving Stephen a standing ovation. He was giving Stephen a standing ovation. Your applause hasn't been completed yet. So think about eternal rewards. I love the story of the, the missionary couple that came home after 30-plus years on the mission field, giving their lives for Jesus. They pulled into New York City, and Teddy Roosevelt was coming back from one of his big hunting trips. It was amazing. The press corps turned out. There were so many people there who wanted to greet the president returning from one of his hunting trips. Big brass band, thousands of people celebrating and applauding. And this missionary couple got off the boat, looked at all the applause, and then went home. And the missionary husband, in a moment of sadness and wondering if it was all worth it or not, turned to his wife and said, I'm really hurting in my heart right now. Teddy Roosevelt, who went on a hunting trip to kill wild game, comes back to thousands upon thousands of people applauding, photographers everywhere. He'll be on the front page of every newspaper in America returning from a hunting trip. And here you and I are returning back from the mission field and we've now come home and there's no applause for us and then his wife in all of her wisdom said something so powerful she said we're not home yet we're not home yet dear friends go wash other people's feet Jesus gave this to us as an example for how to live. It's his call upon all of his followers. And if you'll go do that, you will be blessed. The joy of knowing you're giving your life away or maybe some other way that God will bless you, you can't even begin to imagine. But he wants to bless foot washers. Would you dare, like Peter, to say, wash me all over, Lord. I'm all yours. I'm all in, as the gamblers say. I'm all in. And see Jesus give you every desire of your heart. To Christ be the glory.